Good morning from Los Angeles. It is day three of the 2021 virtual convention, and it has been great to spend every day listening to technique workshops, lectures, and concerts, hearing the Luthier Showcase, the Virtual Vendor Expo, and getting to chat with everyone in the social hours. For this upcoming event, we decided to stream the convention for free on Facebook and YouTube, in addition to our member-only stream. If you become a member today for only $20, you won't miss a moment of the convention because all the events will be viewable on demand on our website. To start our day today, we'll begin with a technique workshop with Matt Greif of the Los Angeles Guitar Quartet, talking about reducing tension in our guitar technique. Be sure to click the Zoom link at the end of the lecture to join us on Zoom and ask Matt any questions you may have. Hi, I'm Matt Greif, and today I want to talk to you about reducing tension in our guitar technique. It's such an important thing to do. It leads to more comfortable playing, more relaxed playing, speed, accuracy. Um, injury prevent prevention is really important, I think. Uh, there's kind of almost an epidemic these days in the guitar world of right and left hand injuries, and I think many of these injuries are preventable. Uh, Many of them are due to held or excess tension in the hands. So I think it's really important to address that. Uh, so we'll talk about the hands in detail, talk about specific exercises that uh, we can use to, to uh, minimize tension. And we'll also get into uh, releasing tension in other parts of our body, the neck, the shoulders, the back. Uh, this is also incredibly important. And all of this leads to, as I say, comfortable, healthy playing but also um, a more comfortable mental attitude and that translates to successful performances. So um, lots to talk about and I'm glad you joined me here today. So let's talk about the hands first, um, a little bit how they function and how tension really works and why it's such a bad thing. Um, most of the movement is produced by two muscle groups actually in the forearm. Uh, we've got the flexor muscles on this side of the forearm and they bring the fingers in to a fist. And then we've got the extensor muscles and the tendons attached to those on the other side of the, the arm. And they fire the fingers out. So tension often is the result of pitting those two groups against one another. Um, for, for, for instance, if I have my index finger like this and I draw my fingertip toward my elbow, it's the flexor muscles that are, that are bringing it in. Now, if I've got this joint cocked up while I do that, this, is, this joint is brought up by the extensors. So it kind of looks like this, like a little claw. And uh, that's the extensors and the flexors pitted against each other. So obviously that's not a healthy thing to do, to stress out these two muscle groups for no reason. And, um, you know, it, it does not feel good. It's tense and, and not agile at all, not healthy feeling at all. So this is often what happens. Muscle groups tensing when they shouldn't or pitted against each other when they shouldn't be. So we're going to talk about simplifying the muscle movements and limiting the moments that we're using them. So let's talk about the right hand first. A common problem is held tension. There's always some tension somewhere when I uh, watch uh, many students play and um, there's never a chance for the muscles to completely relax and the hand to completely relax. So first step is to have kind of a neutral relaxed preparation position. Um, so you know it's like an open fist 
And the idea is to start from this relaxed position, play, and return to it. So the technique uh, that I use a lot is called, uh, I call it play release. And there's really two or three steps to this. You touch and prepare, and then you play for just a moment, and you instantly release. So touch, little tension applied, play, and quickly release. Now, so let's just try this together a few times with index finger. The common thing I see when students try this is, you know, they are holding past the stroke and they almost have to push their finger back to this neutral position. So for many of you, if you've never tried this concept, that's probably what's going to happen. And your job is to become aware of holding this tension and to gently let it go. Try to avoid the temptation to push it back. Try to relax wherever that leaves you. Okay, so again, it's touch, press. In other words, put a little tension into it, and then you're past it. It's almost like, uh, imagine a bow and arrow. You know, you tense the string, so you press on it a little bit, and then once you let go of the bow, the arrow flies, so the, the tension is completely released. It's a little bit like that. So touch, and then a little tension, and then completely release it instantly. Let's try the middle finger now. Same kind of thing. Open third string. So touch, tension, press. Sorry. Touch, little tension, play, and release. Touch, press, play, and release. I, I guess I like the word press rather than tension. Let's use that. Touch, press, play, and release. Okay, and you can do this for all the fingers. So I'll try it with uh, A finger now. So touch, press, play, and release. Touch, press, play, and release. So at first you want to just do this as we are now. Just really simple open string, each finger one at a time. Really good idea to have a mirror. Um, either in front of you or I, I put it to my left um, so that I get this profile and you can or, you know of course you're you can look down from where you're seated and see it pretty well too um, but you just want to see that quick release and it will take uh, expect it to take days you know if not a week or two to to really start properly sensing the relaxation um, and by the way, that's what it is. It's a, it's a sensation kind of thing. Um, the visual is great, but uh, as I say, a lot, a lot of people try to place their fingers back to the middle position just because they know that that's the way it should look. Uh, but it's really a sensation. You have to feel the tension momentarily and then release it. So yeah, it takes... Uh, few days or a week or two and then uh, you'll just keep on moving uh, working on more and more exercises like this which apply this in different ways so after you've tried that simple play release exercise just on the open string um, try try it out in an arpeggio so uh, Giuliani right hand exercise number two is really good of releasing the fingers in turn just like I did on the single string it's just that here um, my fingers are set up on different strings before I play and I am using a, a full plant here you can do that if you want if you know about planting both fingers go down when thumb plays and then 
while he plays and releases, M didn't move, it just sat there on that string. That's good. You don't have to worry about the planting if you don't know much about it yet. These play release exercises can be done with or without planting. Um, so that's number two. Uh, Juliana, number three is good. That's just uh, reversing what we had before. So it's a descending arpeggio. The goal is the same. Just release those fingers in turn. So obviously, uh, with any of these Giuliani exercises, you can just play them open strings too, because I think it's important you take your time and just really investigate the sensation of what, what we're really doing here, Getting becoming aware of whatever tension you're holding and then let it go. Um, so yeah, may, you may be doing these for 10 or 15 minutes a day. And there's no reason to stress your left hand out. Uh, while you're experimenting with these. So, etc. You can just move through all, any Giuliani exercises like this. Um, good to get the A finger in there too. So another situation in which to use the play release would be a scale. Um, let's just use the upper octave of the common Segovia C major scale. So we're just going to use this upper octave. All right, so fifth fret, third string, first finger. Okay, so and I'm going to start with middle finger in the right hand. So. Um, let's just uh, do play release as we go through this scale, and um, let's let's think of it in these these distinct steps I've been talking about. So, touch, press, play, release. 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 So obviously we are going through this really slowly. We are not trying to play legato. Uh, this technique we're working on demands a lot of time on the string. It's a, it's a sensation. You want to feel those distinct moments. Touching and preparing, applying a little bit of pressure, then playing and releasing. That way you're confining the moment of playing, the moment of tension, to a very, very small percentage of our time. Most of our time is relaxed, either sitting on the string or relaxing right after the stroke. That's the vast majority of the time. Now as you get comfortable with this technique and, and applying it to scales, of course, you can go a little faster. Um, I'll try kind of a medium tempo. So at this tempo, I can still think touch, press, play, release, touch, press, play, release, touch, plus, play, release. And I could go a little faster and still keep doing that. So you won't be comfortable perhaps doing it that fast working in the play release yet, but as you do this over weeks and months, of course, you get really comfortable with it. Um, and eventually you'll be able to apply it to even moderately fast scales. Now at some point uh, you might ask, can you really sustain the play release, you know, when your scale gets to a certain tempo? And um, it's true that once you get to a certain speed, there's not a lot of time for the release to happen. Um, however, I would say that the aggregate, the overall tension 
is going to be much less for having gone through this. So even when you play fast, and you may not think you have time to be releasing after each stroke, you will have minimized the overall amount of tension in your fingers and your hands. So it does work at faster speeds. It's just uh, it's not quite as conscious, and the benefit is not quite as obvious, but I think it's, it's definitely there. So let's talk about the left hand now. Um, I'd like to talk about reducing the tension that you use when you're pressing to play notes, and then maybe we can find a way to release some tension in between playing the notes. So first let's just go to fifth position, third string, first finger. And I want you to play that note a few times. And slowly release the, reduce the tension in your left hand until you get a buzz. So there I'm starting to get a buzz. So I know that I'm close to the minimum uh, amount of tension that I need to play that note. I just increase it a little bit. And I know that that's the right amount of tension. No more, no less to use. Uh, let's start with second finger. So slowly re reduce until you get a little buzz. And then press a little harder until that's the right amount of tension for that finger, third finger. And then fourth finger. Release until you start to get a buzz. And then a little more, and you've got the right amount of tension. Let's try this. Let's go We're going to intentionally buzz that little sequence of notes. Here we go. Two, three, four. So what I'm hoping you're, you're feeling is less tension. And um, some of you may be surprised at how much tension you were using before this. Um, so that's really good. You know, you need to get in touch with what's right for this left hand, what you've been experiencing, but the experience of less tension, what that really feels like. Now let's try to find and get rid of some tension between the notes. So I'd like to play uh, this exercise um, in fifth position, uh, we're going to rest second, third, and fourth fingers on the third string. And with the first finger, we're going to jump from fourth to second string. I'm sure a lot of you have tried exercises like this before. So the usual thing to do is, I've heard a lot of students play this fast. And you know that does accomplish something. You're you're working on your finger independence here, um, but you're going to get a lot more out of this if you try doing kind of what we did in the right hand. We're going to take it in distinct steps, and we're going to find places to prepare, moments to press, and moments to release. So let's just try this with the first finger. So second, third, and fourth are stationary on the third string. And then first finger, again, is going to leap from fourth to second string. So what we're going to do, we'll start with the fourth string. We're going to touch, but not press. Touch, then press play. And before we move, we're going to release and relax. And then we're going to move. So and then we get to the second string, touch, press, play, relax before the move, and then move. So press, or prepare, press, 
relax, move, prepare, press, relax, move. Let's try that with the uh, second finger. So prepare on the fourth string, press and play, relax, move. Prepare, press and play, relax, and then move. So what you're doing is only tensing when you need to, and the actual movement will be free of tension. In theory, you've already completely emptied your finger out after playing, and so you should be um, able to move much more uh, easily and in a much more agile way because you're not carrying a bunch of tension. So that's the theory. You have to practice this for a while before that becomes automatic. But this is really good exercise and you're going to get a lot more out of this exercise than if you just kind of played it uh, more haphazardly and quickly. Um, let's try third finger. Now third finger is a little trickier in a way to, to control because it's very connected to the fourth finger. All these fingers are naturally somewhat dependent on one another, but third finger is probably the, the most. So um, we're going to go to the fourth string, press, play, relax, move, press, play, relax, move, prepare, press, play, relax, move, prepare, press, play, Okay, and then fourth finger. Prepare, press play, relax, move, press play, relax, move. And just like the things I was showing you in the right hand, as you become more comfortable with it and in control of it, you can obviously play faster. But uh, don't rush yourself at the beginning. It's really important to get these distinct steps uh, thoroughly understood and felt. Um, so that when you play faster, there's, they're preserved, you know, those, those good habits are preserved. But let's try just a little faster. So first finger, press play, relax, move, press, relax, move, press, relax, move. Do the second finger, prepare, press play, relax, move, relax, move, relax, move. And third finger, prepare, press, relax, move, press, relax, move, press, relax, move, press, relax, move. And then fourth finger, press, relax, move, press, relax, move, press, relax, move, press, relax, move. Okay, and then the next step would be to do pairs of fingers. So this is the exercise, right? So this is where it really starts to pay off because if you're holding a lot of tension when you're doing that movement, um, well, it's tension. It's not comfortable. You're not moving very easily. And when you start widening that to these other wider intervals, it's going to be really difficult. So as much as you can, um, empty out the fingers after they play so that that movement is going to be easier. So let's try it starting like this. Here we go. Prepare, press, relax, move. Prepare, press, relax, move. Prepare, press, relax, move. So you can play this a little faster if you want, but I would spend a lot of time relaxing. So take a moment right here extra time if you want and really feel that because that's the thing that's lacking in so many guitar techniques that I've seen. Relax and then move. Relax or play, relax and then move. Play, relax and then move. Okay and then you can apply that to all the other finger combinations so we're going to leave one and four down and move two and three. Play, relax, move. Play, relax, move. Play, relax, move. Play, relax, move. Okay, and then three and four, kind of a tricky one for a lot of people. There we go. Play, relax, move. Play, relax, 
move, relax, move, relax, move. And you can go through all these different combinations. One that sometimes people forget about uh, three and one. You know, and then four and two, moving four and two, leaving one and three stationary. Relax, move, relax, move, relax, move, relax, move. Um, okay, so one final thought on that. If you want to squeeze out even a little more attention and work on your finger independence even a little bit more, what you can do, uh, let's go back to the simple first finger. Um, observe what's happening with the other fingers. We talked a lot about one and how it needs to relax before it moves. But what about two, three, and four? Are those held super tight? Um, if we're working on one, that's our priority. And maybe two, three, and four aren't quite as important, but they are important. I think it's really important not to just vice grip uh, when we're playing this exercise with the other fingers. So as you're working on moving one, see if you can get two, three, and four to just ride on top of the string and not press down at all. Um, it's, a, it's a challenge, especially when you get to the more dependent fingers, you know, when you want to move, say, three. It's a really a challenge to leave four completely relaxed on the top of the string, not holding it down. Um, but it's uh, really worth trying. Let's try uh, one more time uh, with that in mind. So uh, first as a reminder, first finger should just be touching, relaxing, move, touch, play, relax, move. Okay, and let's keep doing that, but let's observe two, three, and four. Make sure they're not pressing too hard. Let's try second finger, moving second finger and making sure that one, three, and four are pretty relaxed as we do as we move second finger. Now, if you see a little sympathetic movement, that's okay. There's all there's gonna be some uh, movement going on in the other fingers. They're all attached, but you have to be honest with yourself. If you can do this to the point where they're not pushing down or moving too much, that's the goal. Let's try third finger. That's that's the the big challenge. Okay, here we go. Relax, move. Relax, move. Relax, move. Relax, move. So it's interesting to watch what happens with fourth finger, especially when you're moving third finger. It really wants to move around. But as long as it's fairly relaxed you know as I said there can be a little sympathetic movement but as long as it's not tense and held too much um, you're you're headed in the right direction here we go we'll do three a little bit more relax move relax move relax move and that moment of relaxation I want three to play and relax but you can also of course Make sure the other fingers are relaxed at that moment, too. The entire hand should be empty at that moment. Relax, move. Relax, move. Relax, move. Okay, and then fourth finger and the pairs. You can do this as well. Uh, notice what the resting fingers are doing. Let's try these left hand concepts on another exercise. Um, I'm sure a lot of you recognize this. There's a few different variations of it out there. Um, but uh, it's usually played legato, which is good. It's work on finger independence. But the thing about playing it legato, as good as it is, is you're always tensing something when you're doing this. So an alternate or an additional way to practice it, to work on releasing between movements, or between pressing notes 
is uh, to to spend a lot of time relaxing and sitting on the string. Um, so what I'll demonstrate. So we're going to play the first pair, and then I'm going to touch the next pair, but I'm not going to press yet. I'm going to take a moment of silence and relax everything, and then I'm going to play that. And when I play that, I'm going to move the next pair, but then I'm going to relax everything when I get into ready position, and then I'm going to play. And the reason is because, you know, these are tough movements, you know, it's it does require a lot of finger independence. And that's harder. It's harder to move them when they're tense. So if we can reduce the amount of time that we're tensing, um, we make the overall movement easier. So I'm not tensing until the last second. And then I'm relaxing before I play. Another thing I wanted to get into while we're talking about the left hand is the issue of pull-offs. Um, this is a very common bad habit I see in students and it has a lot to do with what we've been talking about. So let's take a look at how pull-offs uh, really work. So a two, we're going to stay here in fifth position. 2-1 pull-off is really, first of all, the second finger in this case is sliding across the string. I see so many students putting way too much tension on that uh, finger and then when they pull off you can you can hear it how tense and sharp that sound is so um, that's the first thing to do is is think about how much tension you're using it shouldn't be very much and imagine sliding across the top of the string instead of kind of going down through it so I think that'll make the actual pull off much easier and then you know the idea is to come to rest against the neighboring string as kind of a backstop, but then release. And this is similar to everything we've been talking about. Um, I see too many students hold it there. I, of course, I do see a lot of this kind of thing where the fingers flap. You don't want to do that. You want to think of that first string as a, as a backstop that you bounce off of. So you pull against it and then just release. So it's, it's a little bit like that uh, play release uh, technique I was talking about in the right hand. So uh, third finger, same kind of thing. Just feel that finger bounce off the first string. Fourth finger. So now that we've talked about the hands, uh, let's talk about releasing pockets of tension in other parts of the body. For guitar players, often the shoulders, the upper back, the lower back, the neck, these are all places where we carry a little too much tension. So uh, first thing is to reevaluate re your posture. So I often have students just set the guitar down or put it to the side and without the guitar, you know, feet flat on the floor, you want to find a balanced position for your torso. So I often tell people, close your eyes and just imagine balancing your skull on top of your spine and uh, maybe lean to the right, lean to the left, slowly lean forward lean backward, and find a good, healthy, balanced, upright position. You don't want to be rigid, but you want everything to feel in line and balanced. Sometimes I feel like my abdominals are a little more kicked in than I would think they are, than they would be when I find this position. But I think that's um, 
correct for most people. I think we tend to be a little too engaged with our back muscles, you know, leaning over the fingerboard or what have you. So uh, engaging the abdominals slightly is often uh, the right place to be. So once you find that good, healthy, upright position, your job is to bring the guitar to that position and not the opposite, not bringing your body to the guitar. I see that, of course, a lot, you know, twisted backs and strained backs. So uh, find the position and then bring the guitar to that. Right arm, relax, shoulder relaxed, the weight of the arm comfortably falling on top of the guitar. Left arm, shoulder, relax, because all you need to do is bend at the elbow to be in a good position to play. So in addition to posture, uh, I think uh, a thing, something that, so in addition to posture, something that really helps me become aware of tension in my body and release it is controlled breathing. And I try to do this when I warm up, sometimes during practice, definitely before taking the stage. I find it really helps me relax and prepare mentally for a performance. So what I mean by controlled breathing is maybe taking five or ten deep breaths, but in a very controlled way, so rhythmically controlled. So you might count to three on each inhalation and exhalation. So let's try it. I'll just count to three on my fingers. Here we go. Inhale. Three. And now exhale. One, two, three. Inhale. Exhale. And the breathing itself is great, but what really clinches the deal for me is relaxing muscle groups as I'm exhaling. If I focus on, say, the right hand, right shoulder muscles, just completely releasing those as I exhale, it really slows the heart rate, relaxes those muscles, and starts to uh, focus you mentally even. So it's, it's a great overall warm-up and mental conditioner. So let's try that. Just uh, you pick a muscle group where you're feeling a little tense. It might be your lower back muscles or your upper back or your shoulder. Um, and uh, let's do a little deep breathing and just really empty those out on the exhalations. Here we go. Inhale. Now release and exhale. Inhale. Now exhale and release. And of course, it really is good the longer you can do it. I, what I like to do right before taking the stage is uh, I find a little spot backstage where I can be isolated for a couple minutes and I just stare at a spot on the wall or something to kind of redirect my mental energy and I take uh, my goal is to take 10 deep slow breaths relaxing the muscle groups wherever I'm feeling tense on the exhalations and I find that this does wonders for my circulation I, I actually feel warmer my muscles feel more relaxed and I'm mentally much more calm and ready to go after going through this and then before taking the stage I just promise myself that I'm going to focus a thousand percent on the music love the music be occupied completely by the music and I just find this combination really works gets me through the beginning of the concert in, uh, in good shape. And then, of course, there's always curveballs during the concert, distractions in the audience, what have you. So there's always something to challenge your focus again. But if you bring it back to where you were before you took the stage, focusing on the music, maybe even take a deep breath or two uh, when you have a chance in between a phrase or something, uh, in between pieces, it really uh, seems to, to help, so I encourage you to do that.
So we've discussed a lot of ideas and incorporated them into exercises. I wanted to tell you to be sure and incorporate these ideas into your pieces. So you want to practice your pieces with these things in mind, at least parts of your pieces. Uh, it might be a little overwhelming to take an entire piece and focus on your right shoulder, uh, although I've done that. Uh, but you know, you can just take a few measures a day and uh, discover, make some discoveries about what kind of tension you might be holding and let it go. So um, I played this little prelude uh, from PFA. And I thought I would use that as an example. So for instance, you know, I might be thinking uh, of the left hand. After every one of these notes, I want to release each finger in my left hand. Fully release when you're going slow. Maybe be thinking about my right shoulder, you know. Um, I'll just play this piece really slowly. And especially in between the notes. Just think of emptying that right shoulder out. It may be uh, my right hand. I might be thinking release after every one of those notes. But whatever it is, I'm focused on one thing at a time. So it's easy, easy to become overwhelmed with this kind of thinking, but as I say, if you just take a section, like 16 bars or something, and focus for a week on releasing the right shoulder for those 16 bars, or a page of music or something, you will get something done and you will feel that accomplishment of improving your technique. And then that will filter, it will permeate the other parts of your repertoire if you're open to that. And then maybe the next week you can focus on a different part of the piece, or maybe you want to move to your left hand pinky and focus on that. But uh, you have to just continually explore and get in touch with the way things feel to, um, to chip away at that tension. But it really does work. Just be patient. Know, you're, know that you're in it for the long haul. And uh, I can guarantee you that you're going to reap huge benefits uh, from doing this. Thanks again for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to talk to you about these things. I sincerely hope that they help. Um, I would just say be patient. You know, these, these exercises, these ideas are often undoing old habits and that takes not just days and weeks but months and years even decades but it's very rewarding to check in every day and see how you're doing and uh, slowly evolve to a more healthy comfortable place to play so i wish you the best of luck thanks again Welcome to the GFA 2021 live question and answer with Matthew Greif, who is a member of the Grammy winning Los Angeles Guitar Quartet. 
in addition to working with the quartet, uh, Matthew was a member of the FIA Trio, and he performed as soloist and chamber musician in a number of different concert settings with such luminaries as Dave Rubeck and Chet Atkins. Uh, Matt, thanks so much for being here and for that amazing workshop. Oh, thank you. Great to be here. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tracy Ann Smith, and I'm here to relay your questions to Matthew Greif. Uh, we'd love to get to as many as possible. So if you're viewing on the live stream on the guitarfoundation.org website and you want to take part in the Q&A, you can just click the link above the live stream and join our Zoom. And there you can start to ask questions in the Q&A feature on Zoom and participate in the chat as well. And if you would like to, uh, you can upvote the questions that you'd like to see answered in the Q&A um, feature there. So while we're waiting for those questions to roll in, I wanted to ask you a little bit about, you alluded to the relationship between emotional and physical tension and injury prevention. I'm curious to hear more about that. Mm, um yeah, well, um, basically successful uh, music making, uh, successful performances um, usually spring from a comfortable, focused, uh, calm, relatively calm, maybe excited, but calm mind. And uh, yeah, our physical uh, tension or lack thereof really does affect our mental state. So um, absolutely, there's a connection and uh, we have to kind of work on both, but I think, uh, you know, we're, we're uh, hands on when we practice every day. So that's, uh, that's, that's, that was the big focus, I think, in the class, of course. Yeah, and Alvaro Enrique has a question uh, regarding the class. He says he's noticed you made the exercises in one position only and wonders if there's a problem practicing them throughout the whole keyboard. Right. So uh, I think he's talking about the fifth position, left hand exercises, probably. Um, uh, no, there's no real issue. However, um, I choose the fifth, seventh position, that kind of middle uh, of the fingerboard area, because, um, you know, it, it's true that um, it's easy to just relax your arm, you let your elbow fall directly, more or less under your hand when you do that. When you reach down to the lower positions, um, we want to translate everything that we're working on in the upper positions. But there is a slight issue of um, what to do with the elbow and your fingers tend to, your hand possibly, wrist fingers tend to turn different ways when you reach to your left. So um, yeah, when I'm teaching students and I'm talking about the ideal left hand position, I'm usually working with them that middle fingerboard area. So you, you just have to, I think, be a little um, very conscious of what's happening when you change and, and move things over. And a little bit of, um, you know, slant, let's say, to the fingers, I think is okay. It's natural. You wouldn't want to uh, take a square to the fingerboard kind of finger uh, orientation and just move that you know, force that down there on in, in the lower positions. I think it's natural if you, you stay relaxed and your fingers slightly turn this way. You just don't want it to become, you know, really, I should probably grab the guitar. <laughs> you don't want it to become uh, really bad positioning where you're doing something, you know, like, like this, you know. So, so yeah, it's really easy if you keep things square here. When you move down here, it's natural th for the fingers to lean a little bit onto the left side of the fingertips, just just a tiny bit, you know. You can still have a good position, functional position, and allow for the different uh, physicality down there. Yeah. All Hope right. that answered the question. Yeah. Um, Al Elisco asks, could you discuss tension with the bar? Okay. Um, Sure. Um, that's a good question. A lot of people um, struggle with the bar, right? Um, you do need a fair amount of tension, uh, depending on the chord, to, to make the bar work, you know, without a lot of buzzing. Um, the question is maybe how to avoid too much, but, but have enough. What I, you know, there's a few little tricks I've kind of learned over the years. Um, one is um, 
basically, uh, if you right under your knuckle here, there's um, well, it's the edge of that knuckle, uh, the joint. It's it's the underside of the knuckle, and you know you can almost hook the edge of the fingerboard on in that spot. And I was taught to kind of do that, find that spot and then place the bar. And when you do that, you can almost feel like you're hanging your arm off of that spot. So you're using, you're, you're allowing gravity to help you put a little extra tension onto the bar. Um, so that, that, that concept always uh, helped me a little bit um, at the beginning. Another little secret is to not do a bar straight on like this. Uh, but turn to the left slightly because the left side of her finger is a more flat bony uh, surface so it's easier to press down with even tension across all the strings if you're doing that. If you're pressing here you've got these fleshy parts and then the occasional joint bony part so you've got these uneven you know these different kind of surfaces and so you're gonna have to press a lot harder there because if you're in this spongy, fleshy part, uh, it's it's much harder to to press the string down as far as the bone bony hard part is. So yeah, if you think of leaning to the left a little bit and engaging that side of your finger, the bony part of your finger. So there's some other tricks, but those always uh, helped me and most of my students I found. Excellent. Um... This is a little bit of a different topic, but very interesting considering you talked about your experience with improvisation uh, before we started. So Frederick Lau says, do you have any suggestions on classical improvisation on guitar? He's been really curious about improvising classical genres like sonatas, fugues, etc. on guitar. Mm -hmm. um, any method books to recommend for beginners? Sure. Well, um, <laughs> I haven't improvised any fugues yet. That, that I would I would love to do that. Maybe by the time I'm 80, I'll figure that out. Um, that's pretty tough. But uh, sure, to get started, um, you know, um, I have a. I'm not trying to plug anything here, but I answered a question like that on my tone base video. Where I talk about you know, like borrowing some classical ideas and applying them to improvisation. Um, so I won't go into all that, but you maybe can check that out if you do tone bass. Um, basically, um, let's see how to answer that quickly. Uh, there's some, there are some advanced books I would recommend. Dujan Bogdanovich has a couple amazing books on improvisation for classical guitarists. So I would refer you to that uh, eventually. Um, if you're just beginning, um, I would say a couple things. You could walk down the kind of jazz improvisation road if you wanted. You're going to get a lot out of whatever you learn out of a jazz book or from a jazz guitar teacher. But you know what's really fun for a classical guitarist is to just, like say, play on one string and like maybe find a scale on one string. I mean, we can all do that. And uh, we can all find that by ear, and we know the we know the fingerboard typically if we're classical guitarists pretty well. So we can start messing around. We know we can figure out where the right notes are, and then just let your ear you know guide you around, and you can play uh, things anything by ear is really good. That that's related to improvisation. Improvisation ideally should be what's springing from your imagination and uh, there's got to be, you have to feed your imagination by learning by ear too. So you could do, you know, and it sounds a little silly or but it's it's really not. It's you're you're really engaging your mind. You're you're uh, fostering a direct con uh, connection between the instrument and how it works and your musical imagination, your ear. So that's actually a fantastic way to start improvising and wake up the whole ear fingerboard connection. So yeah, little nursery rhymes, pop melodies that you like, Mozart melodies that you like, whatever it is that you hear and you want to uh, 
see if you can discover on the guitar. That that's a wonderful way. So you can just try one string and then maybe a melody on two strings. You know, it gives you a lot more range. Um, that's a fantastic way to get started. Improvisation doesn't have to be jazz style or whatever. It's just uh, exploring, really, exploring your instrument with your ear. So that's a lot of fun and easy to do. And I think really uh, every classical guitarist should do that. Uh, it it uh, you have to be a great improviser, but you should be able to get around a little bit by ear on your instrument, and and then you'll you know, you know your classical piece is better, you, deeper, you know, and from a different perspective. So that's, uh, that's the short answer anyway. Excellent. Um, Neil McMillan asks, uh, do you have any specific suggestions for older recreational players? Specific section, uh, suggestions for older recreational players? Just as far as technique, I guess. I um, imagine it's improving technique. Um, yeah. Neil, you can let us know if you if you didn't mean that <laughs> yeah um well uh you know um uh, scott Tennant's book pumping nylon is really fun um uh it, it can be as serious or as casual as you want it to be so that's a really fun book uh even if you're a casual uh amateur or whatever just doing it uh, you know 30 minutes a day for fun or whatever uh, that's a great book. You can go in as far as you want to technique and you can just like almost just open any page and get a little idea. And there are other books like that. Um, another great book uh, that factored a lot into my own um, philosophy is uh, Lee Ryan's uh, um, The Natural Classical Guitar. I think it's still in print. <laughs> and uh, that book also is, a, it's a beautiful book just to read. It's kind of like a Zen in the Art of Archery or something kind of book, and uh, you know you you can you can just just like the other book, you know you can just try out a few ideas a day and see what works for you. Um, so um, those are some 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 things that come to mind, and of course uh, finding a good teacher is always good because that that gives you a few things to work on, and a good teacher will know how to. Um, pace your assignments to your interest level and the time that you have and all that kind of thing. So I hope that helps. <laughs> yeah, I heard a, an interesting quote recently. It was, um, the student is the curriculum. I thought that was huh. very, you know, a good way to look at it because, as, you know, we can see from some of these questions, we're all coming at this guitar thing from different sides. Right. Um, right. So a great, a good teacher is going to be a great way to go forward. Okay, and speaking of which, Sharon Katz says she's an older player with arthritis in her thumb, hmm. thumbs, and other places, <laughs> she says. Uh, she says it was very helpful for her to hear your workshop. And Jean Kennedy loved your class as well, and has a question about a student of hers. Um, she says, I know you spent a good portion of your class addressing the left hand. Um, she has a student who struggles to align the right hand and plucks the strings without any curve to the largest knuckles or the MCPs, she says, and wonders if you have any suggestions or exercises that would address that. Hmm. Um, uh, well, uh, first of all, let me just say I'm, I'm really glad people got something out of the class. Uh, even if it's one idea that you can just try out, I think it's... Uh, we're all on our own little journey of exploration and um, you know uh, it's not the same answer for every person so I I hope that uh, you get something out of this class and, and uh, it's great to hear that you sounds like some of you are anyway um, as far as the um, the right hand goes um, yeah I didn't talk about positioning I guess too much actual positioning I mean what I always what always made sense to me is to think of the right hand the basic position as um, a loose open fist and the plucking of the string is the closing of that fist so if you do that um, you do have the curvature um, that uh, I think it sounded like uh, the teacher wanted in their students so that's a that's a good example I think for a student just to constantly remind them um, you know, look, you know, drop your hand to your side and notice the curvature of the fingers. That's natural. That's relaxed. That should be our starting position. So I would weekly or whatever, you know, remind them of that and have them try it right in front of you because that's, that's really, 
in the long run, that's the key. They have to be their own teacher eventually, and they have to have those personal references, I think, to make it make sense for them. But anyway, if they just insist on playing with, you know, a straight finger or something, um, you know, I, it, it's tough. I, I, I always maybe just would suggest have them starting from zero, you know, drop their hands to the, their arms, hands to their side, and then see if they can put that on the instrument. Um, too many people just sit down with their instrument and they just go, okay, I'm going to practice, you know, and they kind of go into their normal thing without that kind of reset. So several times a day, I would encourage them to just do that reset from zero. And I think if they do that enough times, then um, they will see how like playing with a real rigid, starting with a real rigid finger or something like that is not comfortable. It just uh, it takes some effort and some stubbornness <laughs> to do that. So hopefully, I think maybe as a teacher, our job is to be gently relentless about uh, <laughs> these these uh, reminders and, uh, you know, show them that it's in their best interests. So, you know, we want them to play comfortably and naturally. And uh, that's a little different for everybody. That's why I think it's so different important for them to to figure it out you know from the inside out you know they've got to yeah. they've got to have the idea almost you know let them figure out feel like they have the idea themselves that would be the real magic trick for a teacher <laughs> so um we're going to continue discussing a little bit here but the live stream is going to go to the next event okay. so um those who want to keep asking questions you can feel free to stick around and um the rest of you will see you at the next the next event. Um, I Thanks so much, Matt, for getting us off to a great start today. For this event, we decided to stream the content for free on Facebook and YouTube, in addition to the stream on our website. Besides the content you've just seen, we have lectures, concerts, master classes, a virtual vendor expo, Zoom social hours, and so much more. For only $20, you can become a member today. You won't miss a moment of the convention because every event will be viewable on demand on our website along with the live stream. We hope to see you there. But alas, it is time for us to switch back to our members only stream on the GFA website. We will now have a lecture by Ethan Lawrence focused on the topic of the arranger's role in interpretation. Be sure to join us on Zoom following the lecture and ask Ethan any questions you may have.